Hello, B here, and welcome back to Biology. We are finishing up our unit on biodiversity today with a brief look at the animal kingdom. If you love animals and are sad that we are only spending one lesson on them, good news. You'll actually spend the whole next unit learning about animals in detail. We'll introduce the basics of this final kingdom today so you can compare the organisms in it to the ones we've already studied. Look at all these different and unique organisms. What do they all have in common? You probably guessed that they are all animals. Some animals are tiny, microscopic even. Others are quite possibly larger than your house. What about humans? Yep, we are animals too. If you find that surprising, just ask yourself, what is the other possibility? We're definitely not plants. But how do you think animals differ from plants and the other kingdoms we've studied? We'll look at that more today. Before we get started with today's lesson, let's look at our goals. By the end, you'll be able to Describe common characteristics of animal cells List and give examples from major animal phyla And determine how closely related two species are based on their taxonomy. From a cellular level, it's easy to distinguish animals from other types of organisms. Remember that all of the other kingdoms we've looked at so far had a characteristic cell wall. Bacteria cells were made of peptidoglycan, which made gram stains turn purple or pink. Plant cell walls are made of cellulose, which helps give them their rigid structure. And fungal cell walls are always made of chitin. What about animal cells? Well, a characteristic of animal cells is they simply don't have a cell wall. None at all! They do have a comparatively thinner cell membrane. Without the rigid structure of a cell wall, animal cells often appear to be rounder under the microscope than plant cells. It is thought that the absence of the cell wall made it easier for animal cells to differentiate into a wide diversity of cell types and tissues. Another difference also has to do with something they lack. Chloroplasts. Plant cells and even the cells of some protists can do photosynthesis with these super-powered organelles. But alas, human and our other animal cousins are not green because we lack these structures and thus must eat food to survive. In the previous lesson, we learned about several different types of plant tissue, dermal, vascular, and ground. Animals have multiple types of tissue as well. Remember that tissues are groups of similar cells that work together. The cells in many species of animals bond together in what is known as an extracellular matrix. It is held together with the molecule collagen, and when it becomes calcified, it turns into bones, shells, or other hard body parts. Remember all those organelles we learned about several units ago? We can find most of them in an animal cell ribosomes to make protein, mitochondria to produce energy from the food we eat, lysosomes to break down materials. Can you remember any others? One that you hopefully haven't forgotten is the nucleus. What is stored inside the nucleus? DNA, of course! Almost all animal cells are diploid, meaning they contain two of each chromosome inside the nucleus. Because one of those chromosomes came from the female parent and one came from the male parent. The only exception are the gametes. These animal cells are only used for reproduction and are haploid, meaning they only contain one copy of each chromosome. Remember that only one from each pair of chromosomes can be passed on to offspring, not both. In the next unit, you'll learn more characteristics that set animals apart from species in the other kingdoms. Pause the video for a moment and record some ideas of what you think these differences might be. As you go through the next unit, see if any of your ideas are right.
The animal kingdom, just like the other kingdoms, is divided into many phyla. There are around 35 recognized phyla in the animal kingdom. It's sometimes common to study animals in groups that don't necessarily correspond to their phyla, such as in this chart, where animals have been grouped into vertebrates and invertebrates. But it's good to be familiar with the scientific classifications of phyla as well, so we'll take a look at just a few of them today. The phylum that contains the simplest animal is periphera. The name periphera comes from por, because these animals are filled with many pores to allow water to flow through and hopefully bring nutrients with it. Common organisms in this phylum include colorful sponges that can be found on the ocean floor. In the phylum Nematoda, we find these fascinating little creatures. Nematodes, also known as roundworms, are most often microscopic in size, though some can reach lengths of a few millimeters, which you might only need a magnifying glass to study in detail. Here's a staggering statistic for you. There are approximately 57 billion nematodes for every human on Earth. They are vitally important to soil ecosystems and keep soil healthy for plants and other organisms to grow. Another phylum of worms, the annelids, are segmented worms, such as leeches, and the common earthworms you probably had fun digging out of the ground as a kid. Who knew worms were so important in animal taxonomy? You'll study the mollusk and arthropod phyla in more detail in the next unit, but for now, know that these include common marine animals such as lobsters, clams, and the octopus, as well as land animals that we sometimes find a bit pesky. Insects. Love them or hate them, they are a critical part of the ecosystem and none of it would function without them. In the Echinodermata phylum, we find animals like starfish, sea urchins, and sand dollars that have radial symmetry. Most animals tend to have bilateral symmetry, which means symmetry between the left and right side. But organisms in this phylum show symmetry around a central axis. As strange as it might seem, these creatures are more closely related to our next phylum than the others we've talked about, and our next phylum includes you. The chordata phylum contains many of the animals you are more familiar with. Fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, and even humans. Many people assume that the chordates are all vertebrates, meaning they have backbones, but technically, chordates are only guaranteed to have a notochord. So chordates such as the tunicates and lancelets have a flexible notochord rod, not made of vertebrae that can be seen during their larval stage, as shown here. You'll spend much of the next unit learning about the vertebrate classes of chordates. One of the main goals of taxonomy is to group species into categories that explain evolutionary relationships. For example, this horned viper is more closely related to the northern bald ibis than it is to the stag beetle because the viper and the ibis are both in phylum chordata, while the beetle is in phylum arthropoda. This means that the viper and ibis share a more recent common ancestor than the viper and the beetle. Let's try another one. Do you think a wolf is more closely related to an American buffalo or a spotted hyena? Notice that they are all in class mammalia. The wolf and hyena are both in order carnivora, meaning they eat other animals. The buffalo, however, is in order artiodactyla, which means it is a hoofed animal that bears weight on two toes. Sometimes these taxonomic descriptions feel very random, but since the buffalo is in a different order, it is not as closely related to the wolf as the hyena is. So the wolf and hyena share a more recent ancestor here. A good way to see the evolutionary relationships among taxonomic classifications is to look at a cladogram. 
This is a branching diagram that indicates not only which species evolved from what, but also shows defining characteristics that set classes apart. In this cladogram, we can trace the evolution of various animal phyla. Starting from the left, we have our protist-like ancestor that was single-celled. From there, multicellular animals such as sponges evolved. As species adapted to grow more unique layers of tissue, the cnidarians appeared. Diversification and more advanced features appear down the line in flatworms and roundworms. You'll learn more about the coelom in the PDF, but it was the defining characteristic that led to the mollusks and arthropods. We see echinoderms developing their radial symmetry, and then chordates appearing near the end of the cladogram, which indicates that they were the most recent to evolve. As we went through the lesson today, we looked at characteristics of animal cells and saw examples from a few different animal phyla. We also explored how the classification of animals gives us clues about their evolutionary ancestry. In the next unit, you'll dive deeper into several groups of animals and see lots more examples of animals adapting to all kinds of habitats and conditions. But before you get there, don't forget to complete the review and assessment in the next lesson of this unit. Until then, remember that biology isn't just science, it's the way of life. See you next time. Hey, hey.